the old ways are gone, and yet they must be carried on, or life on earth will not go on. So on June 11th, 2020, storyteller Thomas Doty passed away. It's impossible to know how many people he reached in relating traditional stories from local native people. Thousands of school children entered that rich world created for them by Doty, and community members overfilled venues where he made presentations. Leaving such a warm, impactful legacy, Thomas Doty will be fondly remembered. To support that legacy, I humbly present this tribute to Thomas Doty on RVTV. This is There Was a House, part one of One with the Story, a tribute to Thomas Doty. Doty had many friends. Among the earliest is Mary Buckley. Well, um, Tom and I were very old friends. We went to high school together and uh, knew each other then. And we had a lot of background in common because both of our families were original pioneer families here in the area. I grew up on the Applegate um, and the Buckleys have been on the Applegate since 1854. Tom's family was from Sam's Valley, which you probably know. And uh, he had uh, a lot, done a lot of genealogical research, and so had I. So we had that in common. We also have in common um, uh, our partial indigenous backgrounds. And so uh, I was actually um, adopted into a tribe in 1972. And that's been my focus for my spirituality and many of the other things that I've done since then. Do you and, mean the, w which tribe? Uh, Blackfeet. And um, in once the, um, once the tests came out for people to find out their um, ancestry, I discovered that my Native American ancestry was actually Nez Perce and Blackfeet. And the, the man who was my mentor, Uncle Billy, as we called him, a very important man who had worked with the American Indian Movement, Leonard Peltier and those people back um, in the uh, 70s when those uh, protests were going on, and um, actually spent some time in prison because of those you know, terrible events that happened with the FBI then and came out um, a very spiritual person and spent a lot of time mentoring people and helping them come to an understanding of real Native American um, ways. Of course, in the 70s, we saw a lot of people that, you know, <laughs> I guess you'd say, like to dress up like Indians. And so anyway, um, but, uh, Tom, in the meantime, was learning all of his storytelling from uh, different people. And there's lots of information on all the folks that he worked with, John Medicine Horace Kelly, and of course, um, uh, uh, Chief Jackson from the um, Northern Takelma tribe, which of course is out of Canyonville. Um, they call them the seven consolidated feather tribe now because there was a large group of people there when most of the natives in southern Oregon were picked up and taken off to the reservations at Siletz and Grand Ron Warm Springs. They were missed. And so um, um, Chief Jackson actually was the one who was able to reestablish that reservation and the rights of those people by going to Congress. And his grandson, uh, Jesse, is carrying on his tradition to some extent. He's the principal of the high school in Canyonville, a wonderful young man. And one of the projects that Tom and I were working on 
just prior to when the virus hit and you know and so forth and uh of course we were hoping to have grandma work with us before she passed away was um working on um establishing a cultural center down here in southern oregon that we might be able to um attached to the cultural center on on the um, up in Canyonville on the property that Jesse has, which was actually his grandfather's home. Well, for me, storytelling really began with, <clears throat> excuse me, Grandma Maud. She was our, our family storyteller and she would, you know, gather us kids around a fire, tell us stories. And, and many of those stories were our native stories from this area. And even though she died when I was pretty young, I was nine, um, I've never forgotten those stories. And uh, I went through school studying all kinds of different things, mostly writing. But eventually I spent a year with the Clinket Indians up in Alaska. Mm. And the Clinkets took me under their wing. I was able to go to the ceremonies and the dances and of course the storytelling. And when I came back home to Southern Oregon, um, it was clear to me that nobody was keeping alive our native stories. Uh, the ones my grandma had told me. And so I decided that would be me. And of course, back then, there were no workshops in storytelling. You can get a degree now in storytelling at a college. So I did what storytellers have done for thousands of years. I sought out the elders, and I had many, many wonderful teachers, elders who I would sit with for hours and hours and listen to their stories and listen to the, to the stuff about the culture and go home and madly scribble into my notebooks everything I could remember. And that was my beginning. And in 1981, I did my first performance, and that's what I've been doing ever since. Tom's biggest source of income, and really his greatest joy, was going into the schools and telling stories to the children. And he loved it, and it was so wonderful uh, to hear his enthusiasm about different children that he would meet where these stories would spark questions that many adults would never even think to ask. And the, um, the enthusiasm of the kids and the ability to share something that a lot of these children had never heard about, didn't know anything about. Well, I was really fortunate early on in my storytelling, I became part of the arts and education program. And I did residencies at schools for weeks at a time all over the state of Oregon. And it was during that time I was really able to, to develop some really interesting workshops and classes and ways of incorporating storytelling into the classroom. And so doing that for years was a great way for me to find all the possible ways that storytelling can teach us, can inform us. And that was kind of my beginnings. And, and it was just about, oh, a few months ago, I kind of semi-retired from the teaching part of my storytelling. Mm -hmm. But what I've done is I've taken all of that information that I, I learned with those workshops and incorporated that into the narratives of my performances, into the storytellings themselves. So for me, it feels like I've come full circle because for us Native people, the stories have always been the way we have learned about ourselves. Everything is passed through the stories. Everything we believe in, our history, our folklore, practical things like building houses, finding huckleberries, going fishing, all that stuff comes through the stories. So now that I'm putting all that into the stories themselves, it seems like I've come back to a very traditional way of education, and that is educating about our Native culture through the stories the same way we've been doing it for a long time. Um, our visions and our dreams and our ideas for a lot of these uh, stories that he was continuously creating. And he was working on um, a series of stories about um, medicine women, women who heal. And um, I have a degree in herbal medicine, and so that's pretty much my focus on what I do. Plants are my friends, and uh, 
we had had many talks about Basket Woman and some of the other characters that um, he was creating for these stories. A lot of it was based on real story tales that had been handed down. And some of it was just based upon the things that were coming through to us as we delved deeper into this idea. And uh, so losing Tom was like losing a huge part of my intellectual exercise because there's it's not just every person that you can have these kinds of conversations with and and have a trusting conversation with people like that. John Kelly. I'm a adjunct research professor, former professor at Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario. But my roots go back to Southern Oregon, where I went to school, went to what was Oregon State College, uh, Southern Oregon State College. And uh, Thomas is a very special sort of man. We both shared in common a mentor at Southern Oregon State College, and it's uh, Bob Casebury, who's still with us to this day. Uh, he brought us together. We had common interests. One of the first things that Tom and I did, one of the very first things we did, was after dark even, to climb the table rocks near, uh, near Medford, near Central Point at night, and it was the most amazing experience. White city down below where the lights were shining, giving us enough light to walk by. And uh, there on the rock, it felt so ancient. And you, like you could feel a presence, there was a presence. Tom felt it too. That was at the beginning of a relationship that's lasted for 40 years. I would not say Tom is not with us, he is still with us. His spirit, the kind of person he is, the kind of people that, that make up this world contain a certain number of Tom authorities. The ones that learn everything they can on their own. Tom was a digger for roots and an educator of children. He taught uh, Native American stories at various schools in the area. Uh, all the way over to Ashland and uh, White City and Crown Falls. And uh, we went up to Table Rock many, many nights together, Tom and I. And we learned together. That's my friend Tom Dilly. Tom and I had spent quite a bit of time along the river there across from. Uh, the Gold Hill side, looking for burial sites. And there was an old burial ground there that we were pretty sure was there because there was some talk about doing some excavation in that area, area in order to widen the channel on the river for the rafters. And that would have been real close to where we had kind of decided that this burial ground might be. And uh, of course, with the shifting patterns of the water of the river, it's possible that if there was a burial site there, it might have been flooded in the past and no longer in existence. But we saw signs of things that gave us the idea that it could have possibly been there. We were going to investigate that further and then... I asked John Kelly if his time with Doty helped him connect with his own heritage. It's part of it. I lived in Oregon for more than 20 years. And I made my reconnections. I had a strong reconnection with my family while I was there in, 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 in Oregon. I wouldn't have been able to found my roots, my family, my relatives, but not for Tom expressing a need for it. 
never get tired of looking for who you are, where you come from. Doesn't matter if you come from North America, South America, or Europe. We all have common roots we all find our path. And the stories speak to all of them. From near here in time and far away in time. You bring you together. You taught me that. When I started storytelling, I thought I was mostly all Irish with some English in there and a very colorful family history on my European side. I didn't really know that I had the native blood. You know, Grandma Maud obviously was showing that, but um, that was coming from Missouri. I didn't realize I had anything local around here. And it was a time in about, I don't know, early 1980s, I went down to Hornbrook. Northern California, and I was sitting there with Caraway George, a Shasta elder. I'd gone down to talk to him about some stories, and, and he said, well, what are you doing the rest of the afternoon? And I said, well, not too much. Say, well, let's go up the Klamath River and look at some old-time Indian sites. So this very distinguished Shasta elder opens up his garage and drives out his bright purple dune buggy, and, <laughs> and we go heading up the river. And he's showing me village sites and ceremonial sites. And I'm kind of thinking, you know, these are pretty vulnerable sites, some of these. And we're always concerned about vandalism and all of that. And I'm wondering, why is he showing me these sites? And then we got up to a place called Coyote's Paw. That's P-A-W, Paw. And it was in a remarkable village site, uh, in, intact in so many ways. A, a lot of the old stone stuff of the village is still there. You can see where the housing is. You can see where the cemetery is, the old sweat lodge was. The old Indian trail once ran thousands or hundreds of miles along the Klamath River, all the way from the, from the beginning of the Klamath to the coast is intact through Coyote's Paw. And even up into historic times, the ghost dance trees from 1870 are still standing in Coyote's Paw. And we're walking around that village Village, and I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. One of the few village sites I've ever seen where you really get a sense of the village, the layout of it when you go in. And of course, the spiritual connection as well, the energy of the village. And I finally came around and I asked him, I said, so, so, Caraway, why, why are you bringing me here? This is a pretty sensitive site. And he just smiled and he says, well, we have in our tribal memory still that your ancestors lived here. I'm just bringing you home. <laughs> John Kelly works at Carleton University in Ontario. He says that while the region's stories are somewhat different, the culture and the spirit is very similar to Doty's stories. The culture here is stories are mostly different. Some are nearly the same as the West Coast. The culture is very, very similar. It's different enough to, to be different, different nations, different people, different communities, and the spirit one and the same. Well, I learned pretty early on that one thing about Native stories is that they do have a lot of levels of truth built into them naturally. Everybody in the village would have come to a storytelling in a traditional storytelling for thousands of years from the youngest people to the oldest people and everything, everybody in between. And so it was the art of the storyteller as they're telling the story to keep all those different levels of meaning alive in the story through the words, through gestures, through movements, facial expressions, and of course in, in the more dramatic tellings in the winter even through masks and costumes. And, and so that no matter who you are, right now, where you are in your life, what experiences you've had, you're going to have something you can relate to in the story. Thomas Doty worked with many people in numerous projects he undertook. One collaborator was Takelma elder Grandma Aggie. Her passing in 2019 was a great loss to many, including Doty. For Tom, that was such a huge loss. He was on the phone with, with grandma's granddaughter after she had had open heart surgery. And she was able to say to him from her hospital bed, well, she said real loud, who's that? <laughs> her granddaughter said, it's Tom. And she said, well, you tell him I love him. 
But she had told me at that meeting that uh, that last video shoot that it was up to all of us now because she wanted things to ripple out and she said, don't you stop, you all keep going. And of course I told Tom that, that she had said that and it really motivated us to kind of think about, hey, you know, how are we supposed to take this on? But okay, we've got the, the orders, the marching orders from the top. <laughs> So anyway, um, during the, from the time I first met grandma back in 1981, I was living up in the Willamette Valley um, outside of Eugene, about 15 miles outside of Eugene. And Tom, of course, was down here. And uh, once he got his website up and going, I was able to look at that and so forth. It was long before any social media or any of that kind of a thing. But um, all the salmon ceremonies that he originally did were done out on the Applegate by Star Ranger Station. And I always wanted to come down for one of those, but that was such a busy time in my life. I was raising children. I had a business that I was operating and I was taking care of several elderly members of my family. So going anywhere was pretty much just out of the question for me for many years. And after my husband passed away and then my dad, who was 101 when he died, uh, in 2012, I sold my property up there and moved back to Southern Oregon. And Tom and I, of course, reconnected right away because we'd been, you know, in touch and I'd been working on uh, stories about the salmon ceremony, telling people about this uh, that I was familiar with up north. We had a lot of friends in common up there. And so uh, we just immediately launched into trips to Coyote's Paw and out to look at rock writings. And uh, we had lined him up here in Gold Hill for numerous um, uh, speaking engagements at the library. And, you know, we'd get a huge crowd. And it was just, it was just so great. Um, so, yeah. Uh, when it came to a, so a stop, all of a sudden, I felt a big burden of, well, <laughs> how, am I, how am I supposed to keep going on this? <laughs> Very hard. But um, I've had dreams about Tom, and, you know, I think that our elders and our friends on the other side still come and speak to us and, and guide us, and I'm just waiting for the right time to, and the right thing to happen to launch back into this. And of course, you know, with the virus and everything else, I spend a lot of time staying home now. My name is Chris Tibby, and uh, I'm a native Oregonian and former educator. I'm also the co-founder of the um, Oregon Association for Bilingual Education and was a participant and planner for the Oregon Summer Bilingual Institute. And um, Tom Doty was an incredible man. Um, I met Thomas probably about 25 years ago in the early 90s. It was fascinating to, to meet Thomas. He was so passionate about storytelling. And because Thomas um, grew up in Southern Oregon and had um, Native American ancestry and was so passionate about Native American stories. He was a perfect keynote speaker for our institute and a session leader also. And um, he came and let me tell you, he had the audience mesmerized. His, um, he tells them, he told a mix of um, Native American traditional stories and stories that he had written himself. And the stories that he had written himself, some of them were based on his own life experiences. And he wrote these little books that he self-published. And then the Native American stories he told from the Tekelma worldview perspective. Thomas's heritage was Tekelma. And uh, he learned the art of storytelling 
at his grandmother's knee. And he often talked about Grandma Maud and uh, the stories that she told him when he was a small child. But uh, Thomas had a rich family background and his father loved to travel all over Oregon and made sure that the family got in lots of trips um, to the Redwoods, to um, Crater Lake, and all over Southern Oregon. And so as an adult, it made sense to Thomas to um, keep traveling. He called it sauntering. And Thomas loved to saunter. And uh, he had all sorts of projects that he was involved with. It, one of them that was very near and dear to his heart was um, using Harrington's field notes to go out and document the um, writing sites, the rock writing sites. And he did that with a friend of his um, that lives over in Central Oregon. And uh, he and Roy developed this rock writing project and um, documented as many rock writing sites as they could. So Thomas traveled all over the Pacific Northwest and to other states as well as a Native American storyteller and sharing his story with anyone that would listen. And he worked on several projects. He, he was nationally recognized as a storyteller. And there's an exhibit in the Talent Museum about rock writing that Thomas developed. The man had an amazing, incredibly detailed website that has tons and tons of resources for anyone that wants to study about Southern Native American life and what that was like. Um, books that are out of print, documents, essays written by ethnographers and researchers, and um, just a long, long list for anyone that wanted to, wants to learn more about Native American life. We'll learn more about that website, dodicoyote.com, and we'll hear from more people who keep Dodie's memory alive in our next installment. It's time to close part one, There Was a House. Those are the words with which Takelma stories begin. There's more to come on One with the Story, a tribute to traditional Native storyteller Thomas Doty. My special thanks to Tish McFadden, who put me in touch with Doty's circle of friends. More tributes to look forward to. I'm John Letts. Spirits walking the wind whisper, the old ways are gone, and yet they must begin again. Spirits walking the wind whisper, the old ways are gone, and yet they must be carried on.